giving you a voice. And making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, FRC is produced in partnership with the Blue Alliance. Keep up to date on all live and archive first robotics events and team stats at thebluealliance.com. And by viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun at loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Good evening, fellow firsters, and welcome to this week's installment of your Mouth of the South Region Recap Show. Thank you all very much for spending a few minutes with us this evening. If you were here last week, you know the rest of our shows for this season will be spent getting to know some of the teams in our region a little bit better and doing a mini, a mini deep dive, a shallow dive, I suppose, um, where we discuss their team, season, robot, and whatever else comes up during the course of our chat. So to kick things off for our Southern Region interviews this week, we're excited to talk to a couple of folks from a great team in Pearland, Texas. With us this evening is 5414 Paradox. So let's dive right in and get to know our guests reporting for first updates now. I'm Marco. And I'm Michael. So let's start off by giving you guys the opportunity to introduce yourselves. Please tell us a little bit about who you are, what your primary role on the team is, and what you're most looking forward to sharing about your team tonight. Sounds good. Um, my name is Andrew Hartnett. I'm the mentor and founding mentor uh, for Paradox, and I'm most excited, I think, to talk about some of our outreach initiatives that uh, our kids have really taken ownership of this year. So um, I'm Ayu Singh. I'm the chief engineer of 5414 and operator of 5414, and I'm uh, mainly excited for to talk about the overall growth of our team and how we've developed through the years. Awesome. Great. So let's get started here. Um, why don't you guys tell us a little bit about how your team is structured and organized. Um, talk about maybe general team roles and responsibilities and how they're split up and how it all works together. Yeah, so uh, our team has grown a lot over the last couple of years. And so I think having that structure has been really important recently. Um, some of the things that uh, I've done over the years to try to make my job easier as a mentor and engaging the students is uh, I've created a purchase request form um, stolen, I think, from uh, maybe Milk and Knights. I, I can't remember who it was that gave me that idea, um, but that's been useful to have students like look up what parts it is that they need. It helps them get an idea of what kind of costs there are um, and then makes my job easier of knowing what to purchase. I'm not just guessing and choosing myself. Um, some of the other things that we've done over the years uh, to make uh, my job easier as a mentor is we have something called Tigers, uh, Team Improvement, Growth, and Education Records. Uh, so anytime students do something out in the community or do something to help improve the team, uh, they record it that way. That was really useful this year for some of our chairman's documentation. Um, and then another really great thing for us has been uh, that our school district's been good about um, sending out a uh, notice in the summer for eighth graders about joining our team in high school. And so that's been our main source of recruiting over the years and uh, that or over the last couple of years. And it worked out perfectly because every year we have now about you know, between 20 and 30 eighth graders coming in that freshman year uh, that want to be joining the team. Um, and so that's been giving us a real consistent amount of uh, growth every year and maintaining a, a consistent amount of people the last few years. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing how those things pan out, especially as we've grown our FTC teams and our junior highs and FLL teams in the middle schools. Um, and so that's been a lot of fun there. One of the questions that we have in chat here specifically is um, what overall build season schedule do you guys tend to follow? Uh, so this year, obviously, it changed a little bit with um, the lack of bag day. But typically, um, the, during the six weeks of a traditional build season, we meet uh, Saturday from 9 to 6. Um, and then before, we would meet Sundays 1 to 5. And this year, we took the Sundays off. But then we'll meet Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 6 to 9. Um, or maybe five to nine, I can't quite remember. Um, and then this year, we just kind of kept that up, uh, trying to cut down when we could or just only have certain people come in on the meetings. But um, we do that pretty much January through April. And then during the summer and fall, we meet more like once or twice a week. Okay. Uh, kind of regarding some of the, um, your trainings uh, and meeting times, uh, how many students do you have on your team and how do you handle training uh, those uh, students and any new members that join? 
Ayush, do you want to talk any about um, yeah. what your experience has been like? So um, uh, regarding like how we, uh, uh, so we have about like uh, 50 to 60 members on our team and how we train them. So this year we had um, a sort of like, uh, uh, like a teaching where we taught most of the rookies on, so they, we had different subsystems set up. So like electrical, uh, marketing, all of the different subsystems set up and we were teaching all of the rookies, uh, not only ninth graders, but also like incoming like juniors or sophomores and like introducing in what subsystem we they want to be in. And then from that, we're able to, um, we're able to push on through build season and have them more focused and like towards like the subsystem they want to do. So this year, for example, we had, um, we had a rookie that was really interested in the business side. And since our main business lead was leaving this year, we, we got him really interested in, in the business side. And we were able to get a lot more um, sponsors and funding through that. So I think that's a really good thing. Very cool. Now, while you're talking, uh, chat was able to see some videos of you guys um, working with your robot on your new field. Now, later, we're going to talk about uh, your full field setup and what you guys got out of it this year, having the field for the first time. Um, but regarding the trainings uh, how do you train your drivers specifically i know chat was curious about that earlier yeah andrew you're muted sorry my bad uh, i think one of the things that um it probably doesn't come across is how poorly we've been prepared going into some of our competitions uh usually the first one every competition we've had almost no stick time um and so we always have ideas about how we want to do it and we usually just have to adapt and improvise uh, one of the things that we uh, almost improvised to this year was um, we had, since we had such a large team of 50 people, um, we actually had our uh, some of our rookies and some of our second year veterans looking to take ownership of stuff, um, build an every bot. And so we were going to do driver tryouts with the every bot. Um, but a lot of our practice is definitely just involves trying to play a match as close to what we would like as possible. Um, and then occasionally trying to do specific um, drive I don't know, challenges or whatever, trying to get our drivers some practice of doing jukes or pirouettes type deal around areas that we think defense would likely be played. Um, I think there's a lot to uh, do to avoid defense with good, smart driving, but you only really get that from some practice. Okay, cool. Um, so you were kind of touching also on, um, you know, not having a lot of stick time. Is that because your schedule during the season was a little bit, you know, too heavy? Um, how did you guys decide on on what you wanted to, to go for during the season? Uh, so that's an interesting question. Uh, we, we graduated uh, like 25 seniors our 2018 year. Um, and so I thought for sure we were going to have a dip in performance in our 2019 year, which I think has arguably been our best season so far. Um, and maybe not even arguably, maybe just outright our best season so far. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with in 2019, we decided we're only going to focus on the low uh, scoring tasks, all the low stuff, rather than worrying about the rocket. Um, and so this year we had a bunch of freshmen and sophomores on the team. So we're still kind of young um, and kind of guided us to want to try to do something simple. But I think we just kept on having feature creep of we want to be able to do this. We want to be able to do that. Um, and I don't know if we just fell victim to constantly tweaking uh, or just how hard the balls were to manage compared to what we would have initially expected. Um, and so I think a lot of those things ended up with us not having a whole lot of stick time of just like the balls kept getting jammed. We wanted to address those things. We needed to change how the intake was working because it wasn't working the way we wanted it to. Uh, our shooter prototype went from making things from the DJ wheel to suddenly we couldn't make it halfway um, to the goal. And we didn't, needed to do some understanding of what happened um, changing from the prototype to the robot. And so uh, a bunch of last minute tweaking, just be able to get a an acceptable amount of performance. Well, in the end, did you guys at least hit what, what you're planning on, um, or at least were happy with your, your end design? Ayush, I'll let you talk that. <laughs> so um, I think I think the I, th I think the overall design is good, but um, uh, speaking not only on driver time, I feel like the programmers didn't also get enough time to do other things on the robot. So going into going into uh, Plano, we barely had a working autonomous, and the autonomous was just to shoot balls, and we couldn't like get a robot to drive forward until halfway through the competition. So I feel like with with more time management, we're able to get more programming, more driver time, and that's all through like um, just going throughout the years and better time management. And yeah. Yeah, uh, just to tack on to that, um, I, I think that we did not take the robot to Plano that we wanted, but by the end of Plano, 
I was pretty happy with the performance of the robot. Um, the, the kids did a really great job of getting every little bit they could out of the robot that we took to Plano. And I feel like right now we're like a few days of software and driver practice away from being really happy with the robot. But who knows when that's going to happen. Yeah. Okay, well, last question from me before we segue into more uh, robot-specific uh, questions is regarding your full field. So, uh, if you guys in chat hasn't seen or not familiar with the um, some of the socials in uh, in first in Texas, Paradox got a new uh, facility this year, or new full field, and 6800 was actually um, fortunate enough to visit the field. Uh, I, I kind of want to know how the whole field setup changed your build season process, and what were some of the uh, pluses and deltas, I guess, from having this full field. So the obvious um, positive is that we, we just have something to practice as close to like competition as possible. Um, and we love inviting other teams over. So it's great having 6800 down or Spectrum come over or uh, you know pick your favorite Houston teams or whatever and, and know that they are invited over or a bunch of teams maybe if you, you might not be familiar with if you're not in the, the Texas area. Um, and just seeing all those teams come over and how their robots uh, are doing things and know that they're getting benefits from the, the field that we can offer, that, that's really great. Uh, the biggest downside has actually been the loss of space for our prototyping development type of the season because we leave the field up all year round. Um, and so we used to have a lot of table space that we would you know, spread out and build at. And uh, nowadays, you know, we're kind of squeezed in against the wall. And as the team has also grown, um, that's been getting tougher. So we, we need to be smarter about that. Uh, before right, we you. do go into the robot stuff, I do have one thing that I want to make sure to pitch. Um, so our girls, uh, well, not just our girls, but um, a, a group of kids on the team are working on something called uh, Gearbox Girls. And in particular, they have a girls get together thing that we do at events typically. Uh, this weekend, we were going to host a girls get together thing at Pasadena, uh, but we're going to try to do it virtually instead now. And so the intent of this is that it gives uh, girls on first robotics teams an opportunity to interact with women in the field, um, or women in the engineering field, and be able to ask them questions. So uh, this year, we're planning on having um, some panelists still. We have, I think, somewhere between five and seven panelists to talk about uh, their experiences. And so follow us on Instagram for the latest updates on that and how to I uh, get the link to do that virtually. Awesome, great. So let's uh, everybody make sure and check that out. Um, and let's dive into a little bit of uh, robot stuff here. One of the things I wanted to talk about for sure is your intake subsystem, which I got to say was one of the most unique mechanisms, at least in terms of execution or what it looked like that I saw this season. I don't recall seeing anything else quite like it. So can you tell us a little bit about how you arrived at that final design? I used so. To go um, yeah, so going into the intake, um, we knew that both the hopper, we wanted a ramp uh, because we wanted our hopper subsystem to be as simple as possible, but also being able to, to give balls efficiently into the tower. So with that, we didn't have enough space for a ramp. So we thought, hey, why don't we attach like a sort of a ramp to the intake? And that's where we came up with the idea to use sort of like a window shade, which the window shade as the intake is going up it's um it's like adjusting the angle of which like the ramp is at and with that um it also it also creates a super long lever arm which which requires a lot of force to lift up so one of the major problems that we had was actually lifting up the the intake and originally we had two snowblower motors lifting it up and we realized that wasn't enough torque but going into that we switched it to a neo 550 that has a 90 to 1 uh, gear reduction and that seemed to um, lift it up a lot better. And yeah, overall, the, the intake seems to be working really good. And yeah. I'll tag on there too. The intake was one of those things going into Plano. We had no idea if it was going to work, how we were going to get it in the starting configuration to be legal. Um, and then at competition, we figured out, oh, we can just move or like manually roll the 550 can, the outside can of it and uh, get the backlash out to, to hold it up. So that was one of those exciting <laughs> things to figure out live at Plano. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, well, I guess moving up the robot, so you got your intake. Uh, can you tell us about your, your tower and the shooter itself? I know that uh, your shooter was super accurate, so I'm, we want to hear a little bit about it. So um, I can talk about the hopper and the tower. So both of them are powered by a uh, poly belt, two inch, two inch thick poly belts, which we thought would be super useful speaking that the surface area or the, the contact surface area with the ball is a lot larger. So um, that would help with the ball path in turn. Um, so the ball tower has three 
three sensors that help it uh, stage the balls. Although we haven't programmed it, we plan to program it in order to help like stage the balls as, as we were picking them up. And the one problem we did notice with the hopper is that um, is that the poly belt kept falling off. But with that, we plan to also uh, find a way to fix that when we have time with the robot. And yeah. Uh, so something that I thought was kind of cool about the shooter is uh, one of the things that I mentioned is that we lost some of our distance going from the prototype to the real robot. And uh, we don't know the exact exact reason, but we suspected that one of the things may be that we had too much compression for too long. So we had two inches of compression all the way around, um, and uh, that ended up being a lot. And either the Neos weren't recovering, we had two Neos on it, um, and we, we geared it to be in the peak power range, um, or the balls were compressed so long that when it released, it didn't pop out and give it that extra energy um, in the shot. So what we did was modify it so that we only had two inches of compression for the last inch or two of the, the path, but we knew we wanted a long path to try to help with the um, accuracy. Um, and another thing that I used touched on, but uh, with the hopper and ball tower, one of the things that was really important to us was that the hopper could push the balls into the bottom stage of the ball tower without the ball tower running, but that the ball tower would be able to lift it up. Awesome. So uh, we know another critical part of gameplay this season was obviously the end game. Your team was able to pull off one of the Skywalker mechanisms. <laughs> which allowed you guys to move laterally across it. Can you dive into how big of a challenge that was for you guys and how you were able to successfully execute that? The climber is actually one of the areas that I think we were on top of the ball almost all season long. Uh, typically, the only problem with the climber was that we knew we wanted it in the middle of the robot, and that took up a lot of uh, you know key real estate, and so we had to design other things around it. Um, but the being able to translate on the uh, bar wasn't very difficult. It was something all season long that I said, I don't think is really necessary, but we'll see how it goes. And I'm glad that I was wrong. I thought that that ended up being very useful at competition because um, we could just climb and then go ahead and move to the middle. And if somebody else climbed, we'd reposition to get it balanced. Um, but uh, the the neat thing with the climber, I used to, if you want to maybe talk about the release me mechanism. So, um, yeah, we, do, we, be, we have like our own ratcheting system, which is uh, being shown in the video. So with that, it's like a steel uh, L bar. And at the end of the game, when we're, when we're done, the L bar comes on the ratcheting mechanism and it just basically locks it without having to do any like, um, like programming break mode on the, on the mini sim. So it's like a lot more efficient and it keeps us up for, um, it keeps us up more efficiently and yeah. I, and I think the key thing about it, too, is that we had a quick release where we would rotate a little bit and there was a knot that was in that slotted um, part of the winch. And so that would release it. Uh, once we figured out a good uh, method to to rewheel it, um, it worked well the entire competition. Yeah, I got an opportunity to see it live for a couple of matches uh, when I was in planner for a little bit and it was uh, really well executed. So well done. Um, so all of us, all the mentors on the show tonight here are drive coaches for our respective teams. So I'm always interested to hear uh, other coaches' perspective. I don't mean to pour salt on the wound here. After all, Michael and I were partners uh, at last year's Justice Champs, and we ran into the 148 and 3310 buzzsaw, so we completely empathize here. But um, a lot of folks may not realize you, your team was involved in two of the most talked about and most viewed matches of this entire season. Unfortunately, you guys had the misfortune of being opposite of the uh, Space Cowboys Alliance. Um, right. And that's, you know, probably the first community, uh, most powerful alliance that we saw in the world this year, if you were to ask, take a poll. So um, I'm curious what strategy you guys employed and, and what you thought going into those matches that might give you a puncher's chance to pull out an upset or at least a, a win in those matches. So nobody likes being posterized. Uh, and that's definitely how it feels uh, the entire time. Um, but we knew going into the competition or into those matches, we couldn't keep doing the same things we did in quarterfinals or semifinals if we wanted to beat them. Uh, we, we weren't going to beat them at their own game, no matter what. Um, and so we kind of swapped off what it is that we were going to try to do. Um, and unfortunately, we executed them very poorly on both times, but I don't think it would have made a difference. Um, basically, both times, we were just trying to keep balls away from them and see if we could get a triple climb and make up a difference. And uh, it obviously just didn't pan out. They were They were just so good. Yeah, they were. Uh, they but were I do want to say 6,800 and 5414 put up some really good matches against 118 and 231 last year. So I went into those uh, finals matches saying, guys, we've beat 118 before. We can do it again. Let, let's have a, a good attitude about this. Let's figure it out. So I was um, really hoping you guys were going to pull through on this time. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, 
So stepping away from the robot a little bit, um, you guys have done really great work in terms of outreach efforts over the last few seasons, We're running a little short on time here, uh, but you guys won the Chairman's Award in 2018. You guys have followed up with three Engineering Inspiration Awards over the last couple of seasons. Uh, you guys have really done a lot to transform the team in regarded as a, as a chairman's contender at any event that you guys present. So um, I want to invite everybody to make sure and check out the 5414 website. Um, and there's also uh, the link, and we can put the link in the chat to the Gearbox Girls that we mentioned earlier. Perfect. Um, and so uh, go ahead and check it out. But any uh, in, in a, a minute or so, uh, anything particular that you want to brag about or that you want to say that you're the most excited about relative to um, the outreach that your team does, Andrew? I just for me, I'm really proud of that the, the kids take initiative on stuff. Um, we've got some really uh, great kids that, that take ownership of stuff. I try to remind them all the time, the reason that I do it isn't because I want to win with the robots. Uh, that's not why I spend my time or my money or get the sponsorship that we get. Um, and that Paradox is now my tool. It used to be FRC was my tool to impact kids. Now Paradox is my tool to impact in the Paradox community. And, and I think the kids have been taking that to heart. So that's been good. And are you sure anything in particular you wanted to, to brag about? Um, so yeah, our chairman's initiatives is uh, really good, especially um, for me personally, I was new to Paraland originally and uh, being a part of Paradox like allows me to get in touch with more of my community, especially being uh, new to Paraland. And also the fact that we have a full field allows us to connect with other teams that um, aren't as fortunate enough to have, to have a field like ours, but we also get to practice with them. Um, and we also get to share some of our knowledge that we gain through having like a field and all of our tools that we have, and we get to share those experiences to other teams, which I think is really cool. Yeah, hopefully yeah. if the summer clears up, we can have some scrimmages with teams from all over. I don't, I don't want to do anything to keep score, but just come and play the game. It's a fun game. Yeah, it definitely is. So, um, thank you so much. That's going to do it for us this evening, uh, Andrew and Ayush. Thank you so much for the time uh, and letting us take a peek under the hood of the Paradox Machine. You guys have a great program. We look forward to continuing to see great things from you guys, um, what you do on and off the field. Um, for everybody out there, remember our cadence changes for the rest of the season, as our show will be on the air now every other week. So we won't see you next week, but we'll be back in two weeks, bringing you another in-depth look at one of the top teams in the region. Be on the lookout for the announcement of who that will be here shortly. As always, Fund needs your help to stay loud, live, and independent. Please consider giving your support by joining Fund Nation with a subscription or bits on Twitch, becoming a Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now, or just letting people in first know that this is a place to be to get the information their team needs. Don't forget to check us out on the social medias of your individual preference, including Discord, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and live on Twitch. On behalf of myself, Michael and our producer Tyler, I would like to thank you for tuning in and thank you to all of our moderators in the chat. If you're watching live, up next for your viewing pleasure is Best of the West. Talk to you all in two weeks. Adios. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch keeping fun loud, live, and independent.